the working together was so nice that he invited me on the board this time. So uh, I should have been involved from a distance, you know, with Stein for a couple of years now. Uh, when this summer, you know, these two dreadful things were happening, Michel, there was actually like one week where Michel heard that, you know, he had cancer. Uh, and the city of Amsterdam told us, you know, we were probably not going to get any more funding from them. Which was sort of bad, but, you know, at that point, Michel thought, you know, well, you know, I could maybe even live another 15 years with this, and who knows what can happen in 15 years. Then, a couple of months later, when um, Michel got diagnosed with, you know, the fact that you know, he probably didn't have a lot, a lot of time to live anymore. That was almost the same period when the National you know, Council, Council of Culture told us, we will also advise negativity about Stein, which would mean you know, Stein would actually end you know, this year. There won't be any Stein in, in 2009. So these things you know, happening together were, were, were terrible, of course. Uh, but it was also, you know, at that point, you as a you know, as a board of directors become responsible for basically for everything. So I sort of jumped in, worked with everybody here at Stein and everybody you know all over the world. So many people who sent us support letters. Um, I was I, you know we were we were arguing, you know, writing letters to the to the, to the Council for Culture and um, all these things together. In the end, you know we managed to save time. Michel died. You know, which was terrible. Um, he knew, both the right before he died, we, we, we were able to tell him, Stein's going to live. You know, we, we've succeeded in, in, in basically getting another four years of funding. So, um, you know, Taco was also you know, already talking about the whole idea of, you know, the, 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 the closed argument and the niche argument. We have four more years now to figure out, you know, what exactly we should do about this. You know, should we take this seriously or you know, should we, should we, should we, change things or should we leave things the same? So the good news is really, you know, we don't have as much money as we used to. Uh, the city of Amsterdam isn't giving us money for concerts anymore, so we have a, you know, a bit of a problem there. Um, but we have four more years to figure out, you know, how to sort of reinvent Stein in a way. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. And I hope, you know, this event is not what it could have been the last event of Stein, but the first event is like a whole new future. And, uh, that's about it. You know, have lots of fun these, these couple of days and uh, talk to you later. So, uh, yeah, we're going to start the first session with um, Frank Holiday. And the one technology that we have been developing is Junction. And um, he'll tell us about the exciting and improved Junction 4. Then, after, we'll have a break and then we'll have um, David Zuccarelli. Yes, so tonight <coughs> will be the uh, presentation of Junction version 4. And since David is going to talk about the next 5, I thought maybe I should rename it. Like it's Junction 5.01. <coughs> Just this afternoon I heard it's actually 5.06 of Max, so I still would have lost. So, um, <coughs> I, before I start showing the new stuff, I want to tell you a bit, uh, because there are probably quite a few people who don't really know about Junction, and I want to tell you a bit about what this program is about. <coughs> we have even created a complete new manual. For this, you see the first page. And watch the capitals. This is the manual. Um, the idea of the program is that you can read all kinds of input centers from the outside world and translate that into MIDI or OSC. Um, one of the reasons that we started with this program uh, a number of years ago, and with we, I mean Michelle and I, because Michelle and I always have been close collaborators when <coughs> designing software. Uh, we, we spent uh, a big number of years on uh, the Lisa program, and uh, this program was initiated by both of us as well. And it was mostly from practical needs, because we had a fantastic uh, sensor system called the Sensor Lab, which was a completely programmable hardware box. Uh, you could hook up uh, an enormous amount of sensors to it. 
and then you could uh, program it on a host computer, upload your code to that system, and then it would be a real standalone MIDI controller, because that was what it had. Extremely powerful, also the most reliable piece of hardware, software we ever made, because it never crashes. But one little drawback, the price. Um, when we started with the Central Lab uh, in the early 90s of the last centuries, we were basically the only institution where you could buy these systems. And on average, if, if somebody would buy it, you would pay about 1,500 euros. Cost price, you wouldn't earn anything, but still, you know, since it was unique, uh, uh, quite a lot of musicians bought this system. Nowadays, of course, people say, well, for 15 million euros, I have a nice computer and a lot of other stuff. So at a certain moment, it became clear that the Central Lab, you know, although still really like it, became sort of obsolete. More and more commercial companies started creating uh, cheaper devices. And uh, at that time, we hired a new hardware engineer, and we said, well, you should start to create a new Central Lab. It should be modular, cheaper, and so on. Well, time went on, and the price went up of the design. And at the same time, we were confronted with the fact that artists still came to Stein and said, you know, we, we have all these nice sensors. We want to build them into our own uh, custom-built instrument, and so on. And we said, well, that's great, but we don't have any sensor apps anymore. So how do we deal with that? Um, of course, we, we also discovered that um, one particular group of devices was actually quite useful. Joysticks, game controllers. They were cheap, and there was a little utility, at least on the Macintosh platform, where you could read those data. So, Michelle and I thought, well, maybe we can turn this into a nice program. And that's actually how, <coughs> in about five years ago, uh, Junction version 1 uh, was released. It was a very simple program. You could connect your joystick to the computer through USB, and then uh, the Junction software would translate a switch to a node event, and maybe <coughs> the X uh, axis of the joystick into a continuous controller in a very simple, straightforward way. Um, well, that worked actually quite well. The development of the hardware center lab was slowed down more and more and more, and it became more expensive. And at a certain moment, we had a guy doing a, a, an internship at Stang based on the Fulbright grant. Fulbright, uh, and um, his name was Dan Overholt. He's also here this week uh, showing some of his uh, hardware stuff. And he laid the foundation of a little board which was called the Junction Board. And actually, we're still selling that stuff now. It's very cheap. You can look up 16 switches and 8 analog sounds and two ultrasound systems to it. And it basically registers as a uh, joystick, meaning that Junction can, can read it. That was great, of course. And then I thought, well, we have now the possibility to create our own new instruments again. The processing power is not so much like in the center line, in a box, now it's in the computer. But then the software should also be adapted. It should be more powerful. What I want in there is not just straightforward translation one-to-one. -one. I want to have sophisticated mapping. I want to have conditions, that kind of stuff. So I started thinking about a new version of Junction, completely different from the very first, which had more powerful options. And um, as a result of that, we released uh, version 2 in 2005, in the end of 2005. And the interesting thing was that I had experience with the Central Lab system, which was extremely powerful, but you had to learn a sort of programming language to really get everything out of it. And that programming language was developed at Stang, and it was called Spider. 
and was a, it looked a little bit like C, it was much more simple, but you really had to be a programmer to deal with it. And it's time, during all those years that we had this system, and we have been working with a lot of artists, we noticed that actually quite a lot of artists um, found already this, in my opinion, that I'm a programmer, extremely simple programming language, too complicated. And not, not even too, too complicated, it's, it was a kind of logic that those people didn't, do not think that way. And I can understand that. So very often what happened then is that I or my colleague would write these part of script and put it in the center web. So when I started creating the new version of Junction, I thought, well, in my ideal uh, world, it would have been a scripting language. So you're programming again. And then I thought, well, what that means is that in the end, I will have to write all the scripts. So maybe that's not such a good idea. I would try to make something which is more or less accessible also for the, let's say, average user. I started designing the stuff, and very quickly you come up with a solution like Max, where you have these nice little objects and you draw lines between them. And then, of course, very quickly I thought, when, I, when am I doing? I'm creating another version of Max. That's probably not a good idea. So then I came up with the basics of Junction as it is now. And it's a, it has powerful options. At the moment that we are now, I think it's a more powerful system than we had with the sensor app because it allows you to read a lot more different sensors. Uh, it's more powerful in its scripting power and also more user-friendly in usage. So that is a bit uh, the, the history of um, Junction. In 2007, in the spring, we released version 3, which had um, some extra additions to it as well. And uh, what was also interesting is that the Junction program is a, is a program that in basically the, the, the biggest part of the code is written by me. But gradually, uh, more people started getting involved, people who did internships at Stang. So it has become an interesting mixture of code from several people. And uh, that's really nice. I mean, it's a, it's a multi programmer project that it has become. OK, uh, one of the features that basically was already there, but I just want to give that as an example, is uh, audio inputs. And let's just start with the program. And the idea of Junction is quite simple. On the left side, you see the inputs, and they can be user interface devices like uh, the mouse. Yeah, it's my mouse. Uh, I can have, I can use the keyboard of the computer. It's another user interface device. I can, for example, here I have a multi-touch screen. I can connect that through USB and use that as well. So you have all these inputs. That was already available in the very first version of Junction. Then later we started adding MIDI events, meaning you, even if you would have a very simple MIDI keyboard or MIDI controller, you could use Junction to make it in, to turn it into a much more powerful MIDI controller. You could do rerouting, mapping, uh, you know, switching to another MIDI channel by holding down a combination of keys. You know, that kind of conditional could be done. Then I added timers, which were internal processors, meaning that you could do timed stuff. Um, for example, you could set up a system where you, because Junction started also being used in our mobile touch exhibition, where we have all these objects, which, for example, there is an object, normally it's silent, you pick it up and it starts playing music. So there's a monitor constantly checking, okay, is there activity going on, yes or no? And if you put it down and nothing happens within a certain time frame, it will stop playing again. So timers are very good for that. 
you can also use the timer to build sequences, as I will show later. Of course, besides MIDI, we also had OSC. OSC stands for Open Sound Control. Uh, has a lot of advantages. There's no more resolution uh, uh, limitation. It's a network protocol, meaning that uh, especially when you're dealing with an intranetwork, uh, it's a very fast protocol, no latency. Uh, it's great for that. You can even use Wi-Fi stuff. There's, to my opinion, one really uh, there's one little problem, and that is it's too open. There is no standard. What is nice about MIDI if you send a MIDI note on event, every MIDI responding device will play the sound. And with OC, it's you know the transmitter and receiver have their own definitions, and first you have to learn to communicate to each other. But in junction, that is very easy to, to deal with. Then, of course, Nintendo released the Wii, and we can use the Wii Remote, which has proven to be an extremely popular controller amongst uh, uh, experimental musicians because it's wireless, and you have the freedom of moving, it's cheap, it's very reliable, and in junction you can hook up four of these controllers together with the nunchucks. And it has proven to be an extremely reliable system. We did a set of ones where I had created what was called the Wii uh, Gem Sessions. There were four microphones with four Wii controllers. Uh, audience was asked to uh, just make sounds in the microphones. Those were turned into uh, music because besides the junction I was also using Lisa. And um, this event lasted for seven hours continuously. Yeah. And it you now never one single glitch or whatever. So it's a very solid <coughs> uh, combination. Then the demo that I want to show you is what is called audio events. Because what is really nice is that every audio input can also generate some data. So I have connected a, a little microphone here. And uh, I'm not using audio as audio, no, I'm using it as data, meaning I have from every channel, and this is stereo microphone, I have a level, so an envelope, and I have a pitch. Uh, for the pitch, I'm not, uh, well, I'm not really a good sine wave singer, <laughs> because if you sing a pure sine wave, it works extremely well, <laughs> but for me that's a little problematic. But what I want to show you is a little fun example where I basically use the levels to play drums. enormous 
sophisticated stuff that you must do with it. And you, you, you have problems with just a few buttons, or you don't even want to push buttons, you just want to maybe even, you know, get this uh, box, uh, open the box and just get the electronics out of it and put it somewhere that people don't see it. Uh, so you only want to use the, uh, the 3D accelerometer in it and move around. But then how do you push buttons? How do you activate some stuff? I would say, okay, in that case, combine it with the new feature of uh, Junction, the video tracking. And you can imagine you would have a video camera hanging on the ceiling, covering your, uh, your performance space. And depending on where you are in the space, you can select another sound or change the behavior of your instrument, whatever. And that's what I really like about the system. You can use relatively simple sensors together to make a very powerful system. Um, all right, so let's... Take a look at the junction preferences here because here you see the settings that you want to use audio inputs, yes or no, and how many Wii inputs you want to use. And then there are two new parts yes. Arduino inputs and video inputs. I mean, let me start with the Arduino. <coughs> Probably a lot of you have heard of the Arduino board, which is uh, a small print. It's fine. Since I'm not going to use this, it's this little board here. And it has a USB connector. And what is really nice about the Arduino board is that it, it, you could say it's a, it's a tiny central lab system. Because what you can do is using the supplied software, the Arduino software, you can write a sketch and upload it into the board. And it sits there and you can do the processing on the board. And actually you could even uh, talk directly to LEDs, you know, to make a nice uh, light system or whatever, or actuators. So it's quite a powerful system. But again, the problem is you have to write a sketch. And if you think Spider was complicated, well, for a lot of people then writing a sketch is more complicated because basically you're writing in C. And for those people who really like this board but don't want to get involved in writing sketches, we have provided another solution. So when I first want to demonstrate this cable, because of course this little Arduino board box is kind of round <coughs> to me. Where am I? This cable by my neighbor somewhere. And uh, the sketch that's in here now is um, a little synthesizer. Let's see if I get some sound. It needs power, of course. Sorry. It needs power from a USB cable. Connect it. Yes. So well, you have played with it before the opening. So that's the sketch that's in there now. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change some stuff. First, I'm going to <coughs> load the sketch that you get when you uh, uh, download the Junction version 4. There's this one called Junction Arduino. And actually, it tells the Arduino board how to communicate with Junction. It's a very simple sketch. 
So first what I will do is I will uh, verify and find it. And that seems to be successful. Now I'm going to the serial port, which is correct, and the board is also correct. So the only thing I need to do now is say upload to IO board. So I go to the preferences and I say enable the Arduino inputs. <coughs> it takes a little while to initialize, but it is enabled now. I click on OK and my Arduino events are available. And there we are. Here's my potentiometer. Here's the second. Most of the stuff that you see is basically everything below pen 5 is just noise. That's because the inputs are open, so we don't pay any attention to that. But also in here I can say, okay, what I'll do is I drag it to my here. And this one I'm going to here as well. So I do here, I store this data into a variable. And this one should play no events. And Vasti <coughs> should come from the other variable and go to the quick time synth. It's a very simple example. That's the second problem. <laughs> Processing is now done in junction. And I'm, I'm sending it now directly to a QuickTime scene, but of course I can send it to any kind of application that accepts me, or I could translate it into OC data. No problem at all. So, for people who don't like writing sketches, you don't want to dive into the programming stuff. Um, this might be a nice solution. Um, for the Arduino board, you get, as you can see, six analog inputs and 14 switches. Which is a little bit less than the standard junction board, of course, because that has 16 switches and eight analog inputs and two ultrasound systems. Um, the Bluetooth Arduino works as well. Tried it as well. So that's Arduino support. All right. Now let's see if we can enable the video. And what I'm using now is the camera over here.
So, the camera is enabled. I can either use this camera or the internal uh, eyesight camera. Um, if you want to do serious video tracking stuff, basically you need a uh, probably firewire camera if you need live video input. And besides that, you need a camera which is manually adjustable. The problem when you're dealing with video is, um, for example, in conjunction, you can learn to use a certain color. So you can track a specific color. But the problem with that is that if you have a camera which constantly is adjusting and to keep the, the proper uh, exposure, it's constantly <coughs> adjusting the, the, the shutter time and the aperture. And that means that actually the color of your object is constantly changing. And that also means that it's almost impossible for uh, uh, the junction software to, to keep track of that color. Because, you know, we humans are very smart in following a color, although even if it, the light changes, you can still recognize it. But computer systems are pretty stupid in that respect. That means that if you want to do color tracking, forget it if you're dealing with daylight. Daylight is constantly changing in color temperature and so on. There's no way you can deal with that. But there are other algorithms. Uh, and one particular algorithm is the difference algorithm. And if I enable that, you see that all the moves I make give me difference. If I'm steady, there's almost no objects. Now, let's take a look at the object tracking. So the rectangle that you see is basically the object that's being recognized. And also, if we look at the data over here, you see the data, again, being showed. If I'm steady, nothing is detected. As soon as I start moving, I get a detected event, and I get the x, y, the width, and the height. And coverage, which is a bit of a mystery parameter. But effectively, coverage means how many pixels inside the detected rectangle are actually really recognized as to be part of my, uh, uh, or, or are going through that filter. But usually that percentage is quite low. Anyway, if you want to use this, um, what I could do is
I click on it a couple of times, and now this covered object is being recognized. So this can be used. In this particular application, I'm not using quint, uh, the QuickTime Synth, I will use the Lisa software. And what I can do with it is I can um, load some samples, I can record some samples, and so on. Let's see if everything works. Indeed. Yes, that works. Now, I have to check <coughs> if my filter still works. So, I've learned it to recognize this color. And, uh, let's see how we do something. In 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting, I'm able to select a different part of the sample by moving into this corner over here. And uh, let me try to talk not too loudly. I can record a new sound. And then when I'm moving over to the top, um, maybe I should show the, the video screen. And so in this area, I can control which part of the sound I'm listening to. And I need to talk not to try and 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 try in the, more in this over here, I can load another sample. And then I try to try and talk about what is that? Sensors, 
you have a much higher sampling rate. So as a conducting device, I think the video is great. All right, so that's the video. Uh, last but not least, I want to just play a little bit with uh, where I'm using my iPhone as the controller. And for that, I am using a little program which I have not written myself. Why would I? I mean, it's already there. And it's an OSC. Uh, uh, it turns your iPhone into an OSC controller. So I open Junction. Oh, it takes a little longer to start up because it tries to find an Arduino. <coughs> and then I open this particular setup. I start up this little application here. Let's see if it works. Demo time. One thing that often happens is that um, uh, IP address changes. I am getting that. Ah. So it is working. Using is the accelerometer of the iPhone because there is uh, also a 3G, uh, well, it's funny, it's the iPhone 3G. The 3G accelerometer is in there. And uh, as a sound source, I will use GarageBand. And not the sequencing part, all the sequencing is done actually in, in Junction. I'm just using a soft sync.
thanks for your attention. And uh, do we have a little break first? Are there any questions? Or any questions right now? Yeah. <laughs> Is there, is there any facility to get uh, information back out to the Arduino, for example? No. 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 No, we have chosen for a very simple approach. Really, you know, if you, if you don't want to deal with the programming part, um, you just use the Arduino as a sensor input. That's basically the choice we made. Mm. Makes sense. Uh, what sample rate are you getting data from? Uh yeah, we know. Is it uh, regular? Yeah. It's uh, what uh, what uh, the Arduino uses this virtual serial port. Yeah. So what uh, to be honest, I have no idea what the sample rate is. But Do you know? If, I'm um, reading it out. I'm trying to read it a thousand times per second, but I'm not getting that much data. Okay. Are you triggering uh, those requests from the computer, or are you, are you told the Arduino? I'm polling. To, pardon? On board. I'm polling. Polling. You're polling from the computer to the Arduino. Yeah. Okay. And the sketch, you know, spits out the data as quickly as it can. Have you considered uh, looking at using time interrupt requests on the board, uh, dividing down the clock ratio from the? I just, so, uh, yeah, but that's 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 the that's the Arduino part. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the sketch is taking care of the yeah, yeah. But that. is the data always at a constant rate? It's kind of <coughs> I mean, if you're polling, you're not getting always different stuff, is it? Oh. No. It's regular though. Oh. Yeah, okay. More questions? Uh, I was just wondering um, what people combine traction with this what kind of software? Um, as far as I know, well, these are, of course. Yeah. Uh, but it's also live. Okay. It's being combined a lot with. Mm -hmm. uh, I also know quite a lot of people who use Junction with Max. Because, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting indeed. Because you know, for example, to read the Wii controller, um, it's, uh, it's it's very simple to deal with it. And I know uh, quite a few people who, who just use Junction to read the Wii data and send me even Max. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you have tables changed at all since version three? Yes. The tables in Junction have changed. Uh, well, since version 3, no, not really. Um, because in, no, it, the, the, the big change in the tables was mostly since the first uh, two versions. Yeah. Uh, so you still have the possibility to do auto scaling. Uh, you Draw line segments. You can just enter numbered uh, segments. Um, if you really want to do fancy table tweaking, what you have to do is actually open the junction configuration file as a text file, because junction, the, the junction configuration file is saved as a text file. It's an XML file. It's actually a package. But if you look at the package contents, you see lots of uh, different XML files. And then you can, in a, in a text editor, you can change what your table should look like. But of course, you have to know what to do. <laughs> at this moment, I'm the only one who knows what to do. <laughs> but it has proven a great tool for debugging. You know, when people would send me files like that, this doesn't work properly anymore. I would just look at the XML file and thought, oh shit. And sometimes, indeed, I found bugs that way. And sometimes it was also very easy to, to, to fix a corrupted file. But that, again, that is something that is for more for people who want to do hard coding stuff. So that's probably why we've never bothered to document it properly and so on. But if you're interested, I can tell you all about it. Can you show us a bit of the patch for the last uh, demo? Because there were lots of inputs going on. Um, so these are the OSC events uh, coming from the, the iPhone. 
that's all fairly simple. There's a start button and a stop button. And then uh, once I press the start button, what happens is, let's see if we're still on. It's like this. There's no connection now. Yeah. yeah. Besides these events, I can tell that already. We have timers. Mm. And these timers are the more interesting part. Yes, I have a connection now. So I can start. What you see is I'm jumping to state two. Because Junction is able to use up to 15 different states. And each state may have a maximum of 375 patches, and one patch is like this. The most complicated configuration that I ever written was for Jan Werner from Mars of Mars, uh, for his mesh box, and that had uh, 10 states, and each state had about 250 patches. It took me a month to write that. So not programmed it, but as a user, create the whole configuration. <coughs> but it showed to me the power of the program. Anyway, so what happens here is that this thing is just an eight-step node sequencer. And node B is a ten-step node sequencer. They're both running at the same speed. But what I can do is I can mix the, uh, the levels between the two. So that's why you sometimes get a, the shift in feeling in the rhythm. And interesting enough, um, if we take a look, for example, here at this sequence, notes A, what I'm doing is I'm feeding the eight steps through a table, which is called A notes. If, if we take a look at this table, A notes, <coughs> you will see it's constantly changing. Because this is actually how it started. And you see, it's constantly changing. Because what I'm doing is, I'm using other timers that are feeding new data into this table. And this new data is being um, how do you say that? retrieved by this thing, which is called the feed A changer. So what happens, this one is a very fast feed A changer, as you can see. It's a, a little timer that runs in 22 steps. Of course, I'm going already into quite detail. This is for more for people who already know Junction, but that's what the question was about. And this little table here has 22 different nodes. And what happens is it puts it into a variable and it's called the new A node. And you see that this variable is constantly updating. And now this other timer, at some moments, it just <coughs> reads the value of that variable and puts that one into the table. And of course, also at different locations. So this, what happens is you have a sort of pseudo-randomness. And this is true for both sequences, so you have a constantly changing sequencing pattern. And all the control that I'm doing is, you know, this straightforward by rotating uh, the filtering. By this rotation, I'm mixing between the 8-step and the 10-step sequencer. And if I do a quick shape like this, it's the z-axis, um, I'm pumping up the volume of the whole thing. So I'm sending out control number several for me. And if I really start shaking, so it's a lot of activity, then the volume of the drum kit uh, comes in as well. So that's basically how the whole uh, configuration works. I think we should uh, move on. Um, but just to let you know, we have a junction workshop this weekend. Um, it's one of our first. <coughs> Up. And also, Frank will be around for the next couple of days if you have more detailed questions. Um, to figure out that. Uh, we'll take a, a, a quick break um, and then we'll come back with uh, David. But before that, I forgot to say um, if you reserved, 
uh, please cross out your name at the bar. We have a, um, a list of names, and we, we just want to keep track of who's here. And also, if you haven't reserved, which just showed up, please add your name at the bar. Um, so yeah, we'll take a well, Thanks, Mike.